Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, it's Susan Coffin and you are listening to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Audio. Today we're talking about nutrition and exercise, both of which have a real measurable impact on your child's ability to learn more, to behave better, and to succeed in school ultimately. We welcome Laura Stevens, a nutritionist and ADHD specialist, to tell us about a supplement nutrition exercise plan that's designed with busy family schedules and picky eaters in mind, a plan that aims to improve eating habits at school and at home. Laura Stevens will be talking about how ADHD-friendly nutrition can improve focus and cognition, which foods you should avoid, and what alternatives your child would love to eat, the benefits of essential fatty acids, and in general, the vitamin and mineral supplements that optimize learning. Let me tell you a little bit about Laura, an incredibly impressive background. She's been researching the role of nutrition and food sensitivities in attention deficit disorder for over 25 years as a research associate in the Department of Nutrition Science at Purdue University, where she has led and published several studies on this topic. She's considered a pioneer in this important field of study, and in addition to practicing as a nutritional counselor, she gives frequent lectures on ADHD and publishes the Your ADD slash ADHD newsletter. Um, you can find out more information about her newsletter and about her pu- publications on her website, which is www.youradhdnewsletter.com, written just as it sounds. She's also the author of a book called Solving the Puzzle of Your ADD ADHD Child, Natural Alternatives for Hard to Raise Children. So, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. I would like to give a big thank you also to the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar, and that is Omega Bright. Omega Bright is a 100% natural omega-3 formula. It delivers high EPA anti-inflammatory benefits for cognitive clarity and positive mood. It was formulated over 16 years ago, and it continues to set the gold standard for purity, for concentration, and for scientific efficacy in omega-3s. Omega-3 is available exclusively via 1-800-PHONE number. It's 1-800-383-2030 or on their website, omegabright.com, O-M-E-G-A bright.com. So thank you, Omega Bright and Laura Stevens. With that, let me turn it over to Laura again with our thanks for your helping us understand this important topic today. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate that. I'm going to talk about your back-to-school nutrition and exercise plan for a great school year. Here are some keys for a happy, successful school year. On the left, we see an A-plus diet. We see water, we see exercise, in sleep in parentheses, and that's just because I'm not going to talk about that today. Sleep is extremely important, getting enough of it and getting good quality sleep. But I will talk about the other three. And these can lead to a happier child, a healthier child, a better, longer attention span, less hyperactivity, better memory, both long and short-term memory, better achievement test scores, better grades, especially in math, and less aggression. So first, let's start with the A-plus diet. And you really should have 10 goals with each meal or snack that you give to your child. The first goal is children with ADHD seem to do better with more protein in their meals and snacks. The protein sources provide amino acids, which are precursors for neurotransmitters in the brain, zinc, which is important in many metabolic processes in the brain and the body, and iron, which is also very important. You can find good protein in lean meat, poultry, and fish, uh, in eggs, in beans, and nuts. Here's goal two, avoid all artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. A recent study showed that 43% of foods, beverages, candies that children consume are artificially colored. Here are some of the effects of food dyes. Here we have one child who on the right had had some uh, artificial food dyes, and here we see his drawing on the left uh, after no dyes on a dye-free diet. And here's another example, a child at the top before he was put on the dye-free diet and the same child 
Yeah, and the boy at the bottom, it's the same boy uh, after three weeks on a dye-free diet. Okay, the third goal is tracking down hidden food sensitivities. In a study done in 1985, which was really a very uh, well-thought-out study, researchers tested a group of ADHD kids for certain foods. And of those tested for cow's milk, 64% were found to be sensitive. They had adverse behavior reactions. 49% reacted to wheat, chocolate, 59%. Soy, 73%, uh, eggs, 39%, and oranges, 45%. So no child was, was sensitive to just one food, but to, to several. And different children, different foods were problems. Okay, here's goal four. Serve five to eight servings of fruits and veggies each day. And so what's the reason for this? Well, children with ADHD show excessive levels of oxidative stress. They have more free radicals than their body can cope with. And all of these fruits and veggies have antioxidants in them that neutralize the free, racket, free radicals. So they're very important. So here are some examples of what a fruit serving is. One fruit serving is a half a cup of 100% fruit juice. This could be orange juice, grapefruit juice, tomato, V8. A small apple, banana, peach, or nectarine. 16 seedless red grapes, or a half a cup of dried fruit. Here are some examples of vegetable servings. One cup of vegetable soup, uh, one cup of tomato juice or V8, 20 cherry tomatoes, one cup broccoli florets, one cup carrot strips, two cups raw spinach or dark green leafy veggies, one baked sweet potato, or one white potato if it includes the skin, and French fries are not counted as a serving. Okay, goal five. Uh, you, should choose five uh, you should choose servings of whole grains. In a day, half of those servings should be with whole grains and the other with uh, uh, unbleached flour kind of uh, uh, grains. So you could have 100% whole wheat bread, cereal, or pasta. Then there's something called white whole wheat flour. You may have this in your store. It's kind of neat because it has all the benefits of whole wheat flour, but it's made with a different kind uh, of wheat, and which produces a whiter product and a, a product that has more like the texture of unbleached flour. Oatmeal is 100% whole grain, brown rice, and popcorn. The goal six is uh, adding essential fatty acid to, to your child's diet. And the question is, do some children with ADHD need oiling? First, let's talk about what essential fatty acids are. These are oils that are essential for all cell membranes and eicosanoids. Now, eicosanoids are cell communicators that help cells talk within the cell and also talk with its immediate neighbors. These essential fatty acids must be consumed in the diet or as supplements because our, our bodies can't make them from raw materials. So there are two families of essential fatty acids, the omega-3s and the omega-6. And there's a subgroup of ADHD children who have significantly lower plasma levels of omega-3s. In one of our studies at Purdue, we found that 40% of the ADHD kids that we studied had low plasma levels of omega-3s. There have been studies that have shown that omega-3 fatty acids improve hyperactivity and inattentive, inattentiveness in ADHD kids. So here are the symptoms that are associated with essential fatty acid deficiency, and you might ask yourself whether your child has any of these symptoms. Excessive thirst is one. Frequent urination is another. Dry skin is another. And dry, unmanageable hair is another. And these are symptoms that we found in our group of ADHD kids when we studied their fatty acid levels and their deficiency symptoms. So you can add omega-3 fatty acids to the diet by adding walnuts, flaxseed, dark green leafy vegetables, 
canola oil and also walnut oil, beans, uh, in particular navy, kidney, and soybeans. Now these three categories of foods uh, all add alpha linolenic acid, which is the first member of the omega-3 family. Then you, you could buy omega-3 enriched eggs. Uh, these have long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, and, but they don't have a whole lot. Of course, the real prize winner is cold water fish. If you could serve that two to three times per week, uh, this would be really helpful. This could be really helpful. And it, but it needs to be cold, oily fishes like tuna and salmon and sardines. You can also buy fatty acid supplements. You can buy supplements of flaxseed oil. You can buy fish oil. You can buy krill oil. Or you could buy primrose oil, which is actually an omega-6 fatty acid that leads to anti-inflammatory kinds of molecules. Okay, goal seven. That's to avoid high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is processed differently in the body than sugar is. And it acts differently in the brain, increasing food intake. In rats that were fed different kinds of sugars, the fructose group showed impaired learning and memory, while the sucrose or the, other, the table sugar group showed moderate learning impairments. High fructose corn syrup also affects the makeup of the microbes in your child's gut. And these are increasingly studied these days because they seem to have an effect on the brain and the brain has an effect on these microbes. You also want to follow goal number eight, greatly reduce your child's sugar intake. The reason is because it provides empty calories. And just recently, I don't know if you saw it or not, but the American Heart Association has recommended that children should consume less than six teaspoons a day. Now, there are a lot of ADHD kids who need to consume less than that. So it would depend on your child. The reason you don't want to uh, have a lot of sugar in the diet, of course, is because if they fill up on sugary foods, there's no room for healthy foods. Also, it's been shown that excessive sweetener, this is both natural and artificial, disrupts dopamine and dopamine receptors in the brain. And these are thought to be affected in ADHD. It was interesting. There was a seven-day study where parents wrote down all the things their child ate in the behavior at the time. And the researchers, uh, in looking at the records, realized that there was more, when more sugar was consumed, the more destructive, restless, aggressive, and hyperactive the children became. So you're saying, my, boy, my kid is a sugarholic. What can I do? Well, there's some substitutes you can try. Monk fruit is one of them. It's a natural product. There's stevia. It's another natural product. It's been used for thousands of years. I'm not wild about the, the taste of it myself. Or you could use xylitol. That's my favorite. Um, I, I used to buy my xylitol at the grocery store, and then the grocery store closed. So I have to order it online, but that's really no problem at all. And there are several different brands that you can choose for. You want 100% xylitol. So you can use it for cooking. You can sprinkle it on fruits. You can uh, use it any way you would use sugar. Now, goal number nine is the importance of drinking water. Fluid intake affects behavior and learning. And if you've had enough fluid, then your memory is better, your ability to sustain attention and stay on task is better, there's better visual attention, better scores on digit span and pair cancellation tasks, improved cognitive performance, and a happier mood. Now, you want to give your child water, not naturally or artificially sweetened fruit juice or juice drink or soda, and nothing with any artificial food dyes or flavors. Then the t tenth and final goal is to eat breakfast every day. It's shown that children, all children, who consume breakfast have a 20 to 60 percent higher intake of iron, B vitamins, and vitamin D. 
and, B, and vitamin D is often low in kids with ADHD. This enables your child to learn better, to be more alert, to stay on task better, raises school grades, especially math scores. There are better scores on achievement tests. And children show less hyperactivity and disruptive behaviors. Now I'm going to switch gear and talk about exercise for a few minutes. The benefits of exercise are many, like improved sleep, beneficial effects on the immune system, helps control weight, and also leads to a decrease in respiratory infections like colds and flu. And there's greater blood and oxygen flow to the brain to get the needed nutrients there for your child to think. It may improve short and long-term memory, and it increases the neurotransmitters in the brain. I'm going to tell you about a wonderful study that looked at a 20-minute bout of exercise in 20 children with ADHD. So if we started out with 20 kids, and for uh, half of them either read or used a treadmill for 20 minutes. Then after the next week, the children who had read for 20 minutes uh, were on the treadmill and vice versa. And what they found was really interesting. Just this one bout of 20 minutes of exercise increased reading concentration, improved math scores, and it had positive effects on brain electrical activity. Now, there was a, mother, a wonderful mother, I think she's in Boston, who started a free before-school exercise for her child. And within a couple weeks, 80 different families had signed up. This became a larger movement called Build Our Kids Success, or BOX, B-O-K-S. And it's really mental medicine. The mission of BOX is to promote benefits of physical activity for the mind, body, and community. And one special needs teacher commented, I've never had anything make such a difference in the lives of our kids. So maybe you could start one of these at your school. Uh, for more information, you can go to this website, www.parenting.com forward slash child slash health slash box, B-O-K-S dash fitness. And you may be interested in John Rady's book called Spark. So now I'm going to tell you about a little boy, Tommy, who's eight years old, and his mother, Linda. Linda decided to try an elimination diet, and she found out that, uh, Billy, that, Tom, that Tommy was sensitive to milk, chocolate, and artificial food dyes. She also discovered that he tolerated sugar poorly. Tommy also showed dry skin, excessive thirst, and he was a complete couch potato. So now I'm going to tell you about a day in Tommy's life. Um, before the elimination diet and before Linda got smart about all these things, uh, he would start the day with an orange drink, which had uh, artificial food dyes in it and uh, possibly extra sugar and perhaps 5% uh, orange juice. Fruit Loops that are artificially colored with milk and sugar. Remember, he was allergic to milk and didn't tolerate sugar very well. He also had white toast with jam on it, and the jam contained uh, our, um, uh, high fructose corn syrup, and he would have a glass of milk. So after Linda became smart, she would give him a small juice of 100% orange juice, a bowl of Cheerios with almond milk, and xylitol to sweeten it. She also gave him two scrambled eggs to make sure he got enough protein. And she scrambled the eggs with the almond milk instead of cow's milk. And then he would have a glass of almond milk. Here's some other breakfast suggestions. I know breakfast is always tough in the morning when you're struggling to get ready for work and everything and get the kids off to school with everything they need. But breakfast does not have to be with breakfast-type foods. You could give your child a bowl of chili, uh, a plate of stew, some cold roast beef. All of these would provide lots of protein, and the chili and stew might even provide some vegetables. Or you could start the day with poached eggs on whole wheat toast. That's what I do. 
or poached eggs on whole wheat English muffins topped uh, with real cheese and melted under the broiler. Or you could make eggnog. If your child would prefer to drink his breakfast, he could uh, mix together the milk and the eggs, and then you must heat it to 160 degrees Fahrenheit to kill off any bacteria that might be in the eggs. Then you could cool it and add strawberries or fruit or uh, rice powder to provide more protein and vanilla to flavor it. For lunch, Tommy typically took his brown bag lunch. Before, it was lunch and meat on white bread, potato chips, cookies, and milk. Afterwards, Linda set him with this, tuna salad on whole wheat bread, carrots with dip, red grapes, a sugar-free lemon cookie, and tomato juice. Some days, Tommy would like to buy his lunch. So Linda went on her school's website and uh, found out what was being offered in the coming week so that she could choose whether there was a day where that would work out. I went on my website on, on the Internet for a local school here. Here's what I found for three days. One lunch was orange chicken, brown rice, winter blend veggies, and a fortune cookie. The orange chicken would be okay as long as it didn't have a lot of sugar and uh, did not have uh, artificial food dyes like yellow 5, yellow 6, or red 40. The fortune cookie might work out. It would not have very much in the way of sugar. And, of course, he would have to buy, he would have to get water instead of milk. Here's a lunch that he could probably enjoy. A beef hamburger, a whole grain bun, baked french fries, and vegetarian baked beans. Now, the baked beans may have a lot of sugar in them. Uh, so uh, Linda would have to find that out. Of course, he couldn't have the milk they served. Now, the lunch on the third day is problematic. It was grilled cheese. So, of course, the cheese is a milk product. Tomato soup, that's usually made with milk. Little winter blend veggies would be fine. Um, the sugar-free Jello is definitely out. It's high in, in artificial food dyes. We, in a study at Purdue, we measured a variety of foods that children consume, and uh, found that Jello is is very high. some flavors of gelatin are really high in food dyes with food dyes. Um, they offer chocolate milk, but of course Tommy was allergic to chocolate and to milk. So Tommy, after school, would come home and immediately he wanted a snack. So before, he would have chocolate chip cookies, Kool-Aid, highly colored chips, and a candy bar. And afterwards, instead, he had red grapes, a cold chicken leg, carrots with a tasty dip, and strawberry almond milk. Uh, made with strawberries and a little xylitol and put in the blender, or just plain water. Now, after school, Tommy didn't exercise before. He would plop down in front of the television. He would read. He replied to Facebook messages. He played computer games. He faced homework with lack of enthusiasm, just with the purpose to end it as quickly as possible. But he made many errors. Then Linda set, uh, set him up for a sports group at school that met three days a week. On the days when he didn't have that, he would ride his bike for 20 minutes. They lived in a safe neighborhood, so that was not an issue. Uh, or she, Linda would send him on a run around the block for 20 minutes. Or if it were raining, uh, they, uh, Tommy danced inside the music for 20 minutes. And after his 20 minutes of exercise, he attacked his homework refreshed. At dinner time, Linda was always in a hurry, so she would stop and buy a fast food hamburger and fries with a large Coke. And afterwards, they stop at, a, um, at an ice cream store for an ice cream cone. Afterwards, Linda made homemade chili with whole wheat crackers, a dark green salad with tasty dressings, a watermelon slice, a homemade sugar-free cookie, and a glass of almond milk. Before, 
uh, Linda changed things. Uh, after dinner, Tommy would watch more TV and play more video games. He would often argue with his sister and break a lamp. Uh, was Breaking a lamp was not unusual. He delayed in finishing his homework and made lots of mistakes. Afterwards, the family together took a bike ride. Sometimes Tommy played basketball with his father and brother, uh, or they all went on a brisk family hike. On rainy days, they danced to music inside, and they found that Tommy finished his homework correctly without making mistakes. Before bedtime, uh, Tommy would be served Coke, ice cream, and cookies. And he often had trouble going to bed and going to sleep, and he wet the bed frequently. So after the change in diet, he consumed rice, cream, vanilla, or strawberry ice cream. It's not really ice cream because it's made with rice, not with milk. Uh, my husband couldn't have milk products, and he really liked the rice, cream, vanilla, and strawberry. Linda found that he liked it with uh, blueberries, strawberries, or peaches on top, and she would give him a small glass of water. He went to bed easily and no longer wet the bed. Tommy also took some supplements. He took two teaspoons of flaxseed oil. Now, some children need a little less, maybe one or a little more, say up to six teaspoons a day. Um, but Linda noticed that within a couple of weeks, his thirstiness and his dry skin had improved, and he seemed calmer. She also gave him 20, 250 milligrams of magnesium. Now, if you try this with your child and he develops diarrhea, just reduce the dose. Just keep in mind that magnesium is the active ingredient in milk of magnesia. The calcium requirement for age 8 is 1,000 milligrams. So Tommy consumed about two glasses of almond milk a day or 600 milligrams of calcium. So Linda would give him 400 milligrams of calcium citrate powder in water or in food. There's no taste to it, so it's really it's smooth, so it's easy to take. She also gave him 2,000 international units of vitamin D3, namely vitamin D, uh, vitamin D3, which is vitamin D. And she also gave him 10 milligrams of zinc. So here are my recommendations for you. Change your child's diet to meet the goals recommended above. Ensure that your child drinks plenty of water. If he's struggling with homework, give him a nice tall glass of cold water to drink. Add exercise to his program and choose the supplements carefully. I'd like to leave you with some food for thought. Thousands of years ago, in fact, um, about 368 uh, BC, Hippocrates, the famous Greek physician said, let your medicine be your food and your food be your medicine. So you might think about that. Another thing to think about is your child truly is what he eats. If he eats garbage, his behavior is going to be garbage. Now, I've written a book, Solving the Puzzle of Your ADD, ADHD Child, Natural Solutions for Hard-to-Raise Children. Um, I believe that it, uh, it, it talks about all the things we talked about today, but in detail, and tells you how to do that elimination diet, um, how to decrease the sugar in the diet, um, what else to use. And there are recipes at the end that um, will help help you. For examples of these uh, recipes, you could go to www.youradhdnewsletter.com, and there's lots more about the book. And I want to point out to you that the ebook, Google Book, much cheaper than the print copy of the book. So if you have questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. There are tons of questions here, and I'd like to also invite the audience to post um, what your biggest concern is um, in terms of implementing healthy eating at home. I know uh, we all have problems. Many of us know what should be done, but have problems actually doing it. So if you would post um, what you found successful or what your challenge is, that would be great. Um, 
Laura Stevens, can you talk a little bit about how to identify food sensitivities? For example, a number of people are asking um, about blood tests for food sensitivities. Is it commonly used? Are they accurate? Um, how does one, um, one test for food sensitivities? Well, a RAS test is sometimes done. That's a blood test. But um, it really it, it identifies foods that are IgE um, re, uh, related. And uh, most foods that kids are, the ADHD kids are sensitive, it's not mediated through that pathway. So um, really the best way is to try uh, an elimination diet and to... Um, um, to try to identify foods there. For example, the, the study that I showed you where all those kids were sensitive to milk and wheat and orange and all that, you would start out with a baseline diet. It's, it's really difficult to carry out, but it's not impossible. I've done it. Where you serve uh, meats like turkey and lamb, the hypoallergenic ones, and then for ve vegetables, you serve um, all the, uh, like broccoli and cauliflower and spinach and things like that. And then for fruits, like um, uh, apples and pears, things like that. So there are details of all that in my book. And then after you've done that for a couple of weeks, then you try reintroducing things one at a time. The first day, you might want to introduce milk. So you give your child uh, a glass of milk to drink. And you want to do this when you're around in case he reacts. And, uh, um, and then if he hasn't reacted in 30 or 60 minutes, then give him another glass. Does he wet the bed that night when he hasn't been wetting the bed? Things like that. And then if he does react to the milk, you take it out of his diet, and it's much easier to do this than it used to be because we have all these milk substitutes. We have coconut, we have soy, we have um, uh, rice milk, uh, we have almond milk. So uh, uh, there are alternatives. So that would be what, how I would proceed. Okay. Um, I know that a, a really pure elimination diet can be tough to implement. Um, I think one of our um, previous speakers recommended sort of starting with the big guns, I guess, milk. Yes, um, yes. I guess, what would be the most common food sensitivities? Milk? Well, um, milk and wheat are biggies. Wheat, right. And, and chocolate. And in the book, I recommend that, that it, you start with that kind of a diet, a milk-free, wheat-free. That would also be rye and barley-free um, diet. And chocolate free, and to see how that goes. Now your child may improve, but maybe there's still room for improvement. But um, um, I've lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. Well, I think yeah, it's a simpler there, there way to go be. than a pure elimination. I think. Um, yes. There may if be If you other do want to try elimination. Um, sorry. No, I was just going to say there may be other foods besides those that bother your child that you could identify after that, okay. like corn and egg, uh, corn and egg, and uh, orange and things like that. Right. Um, if you people do want to find a resource on elimination diets, do you recommend uh, one? Do you recommend the Fine Gold Diet? Um, well, are there any um, other books that you recommend for? for implementing an elimination diet specifically? There's one um, that's called Tracking Down Hidden Food Allergies. It was written by William Crook, who he's a, was a pediatrician and a co-author with me on a book. Um, I don't think there are any new copies of that, but I think it's one of the best books that's been written. There may be some uh, on, on the web that you, uh, you can get hold of that. It's Tracking Down Hidden Food Allergies. It's and, William uh, Crook, MD, I guess. It is. Okay, great. Sounds good. Let's see. So many questions. Here's a really good one from Joe. How do you okay. transition from from junk food to more healthy? That's a, it's a big question, but I think it sort of summarizes a lot of people's problems with the big transition to a healthy diet. 
Oh, absolutely. And I think a slow uh, way to go is is uh, important for many families so that you would start decreasing the sugar in recipes. You would stop buying any um, foods or candies or beverages that have food dyes. Uh, you replace the soft drinks with other things, uh, so maybe some real fruit juice. But I don't recommend apple and grape juice because there are a lot of kids with ADHD who seem to react to this. And it may be that there's just too much in the way of natural sugars there. There aren't the, the vitamins and minerals. If you have to have an emergency um, soda pop, I guess I'd look for 7-Up, um, Sprite, and Squirt because these are never colored. Uh, and you can get it with the, the regular kind would come with uh, high fructose corn syrup, but you can get a diet version that might be okay. And I, but I'm not talking about using this regularly, but that would help. So make the, the changes um, um, cautiously and certainly enlist your partner in helping you. Because if dad or whatever says, oh, I'm not going to eat that, then Tommy isn't going to want to eat it either. So there may be some resistance, but keep at it. Yeah. Um, I guess the other big concern that's voiced frequently, and I see the questions here related to that, is just time. You know, um, the idea of working families having the time to make uh, cookies from scratch or, you know, um, really have the time to bake and do the kinds of healthy foods that they'd love to do just seems limited. But do I you understand. think that you can, can eat healthily without, um, without really increasing the amount of time? I think that's true. I think you just have mm -hmm. to think about it and plan your meals and mm -hmm. think what you can, what you can do, what you you can get your kids to help with. Right. Um, but something like the eggnog for breakfast could be made up the night before and then all you have to do is pour it the next day. Maybe serve it with a slice of whole wheat toast. Um, right. And if your if your children and your family seem to be resistant to whole wheat bread, uh, you might try the Wonder whole wheat. It is a hundred percent, and it's kind of spongy like the white bread. So that mm -hmm. might be a transitional uh, bread. Um, can I talk a little bit about breakfast? Recently, there have been some articles saying that it's just a myth that you need to eat breakfast. What's your take on that? Um, oh, I, I haven't. A I, of, I haven't seen that. I don't know. I don't know what. The, <laughs> it's like they're saying now that you don't have to floss your teeth. That right. That doesn't exactly. help prevent like you don't have to <laughs> there, yeah. um, So one person here has posted that her child is very resistant to eating breakfast, just says he's not hungry. And another person says, is there something, a breakfast bar or something kids can eat on the go? So I think the breakfast time seems to be a challenge for people for a number of reasons. It is. It is. I guess the, the uh, question is, the boy who won't eat breakfast, does he eat it on weekends? And mm. um, are there things that he will eat there that you could modify? And, and serve a breakfast like maybe whole wheat pancakes with some fruit syrup or something like that, whether that would appeal to him. The, the trouble with the, um, the breakfast bars and those things is that they're awfully high in sugar. Now, the way to tell the amount of sugar in a product is to look at the food label, the nutrition label, and under carbohydrates, there will be a category called sugars and it's the amounts are listed in uh, grams so like it might say 20 grams well that's the same as five teaspoons so you could get an idea then of uh, how much is each, uh, is actually in a bar but mm -hmm. um, uh, and and some are made with honey and that really isn't much better than the sugar there are no right. no nutrients in honey um, Nancy responded, she's the person with a son who said he wasn't hungry, and, and she says that even on weekends, he's not hungry for several hours after he wakes up. Yeah, maybe that's just his... his yeah. It's just maybe the way he ticks, and then there's not a lot you can do about it. My husband was really like that. 
but he would start the day with a half a cheese sandwich. He managed to get that down. And my kids are not really big breakfast eaters, so I, I understand the problem. You might see if right. he's interested in the eggnog, uh, you know, if he'll, he'll be willing to drink something. Um, yeah, someone else suggested maybe protein drinks um, made with stevia. Um, yes, that's a possibility. Not it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, Going back to the sugar supplements, um, a number of people have said that their kids just don't, as you mentioned, don't like the taste of stevia. Um, right. It, someone asked if Truvia is acceptable. I think Truvia is really stevia, isn't it? Is it? It's just the, yeah. I think I think it's just the brand name for okay. stevia. I think I certainly wouldn't use things like Equal. Um, I've had more people tell me that they that they react to, to that than about to anything else. I once wrote a little cookbook that used Equal in the early years when it first came out, and every one of my friends says, "Oh, I can't I can't eat this. It gives me gives me a headache." Or it really. Just, Although, you know, according to the government, it's perfectly safe. But I don't recommend it. I don't think it's a good idea. Okay. They've had more, more complaints about aspartame than, um, than any other additive. Right. Um, here's a, here's, there must be 10 comments here about children who are very picky eaters. So my child refuses to eat leafy green vegetables, my child, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Used to eat yogurt, but now doesn't like it anymore. Um, uh, my child will only drink apple juice. Um, what, what, do you have any advice? I know this is really challenging for parents. Um, how can I get my child to try new foods? She refuses to try anything new. So there's just lots of these comments. Um, well, I've, re I've read that to, to try a new food, you have to introduce it. And then sometimes you have to just ask that they take a bite, just a small taste. And I've, I've heard that you, have to do, you may have to do this as many as 10 times before they finally decide that the food is okay and that they will eat some of it. Uh, it's really hard with picky eaters. It's, they're very determined and they're... Uh, they may be really resistant. The apple juice, boy, I don't know. That's I don't think that's a good idea to drink the apple juice. Um, mm -hmm. You could try watering it down. Put that's in what she does, 50-50 water juice. Yes, and um, see if she can't water it down even further and make it in a smaller glass. Okay. Um, well, here's a suggestion from Mick who says, look for liquid stevia with vanilla at Whole Foods. It's delicious. So there's a good one. Okay. Okay. Let's try that one. Yeah. Um, let's see. Just, just recapping on the food sensitivity thing, how long do you eliminate dairy or wheat to see, to decide if there's a food sensitivity? Is it a day or two? Is it a week? No, no. It should be a week or two. And then you oh, really reintroduce it and see if there's a reaction. Yes. Okay. And then if there is a reaction, you want to keep it out of the diet for uh, oh, a couple of months and then retry it again and see if your child tolerates just a small amount of it. Um, but don't go back to the large amounts that he might have had before. Okay. Um, Brenda set, offers this to parents who are listening in. She said, for parents with extremely picky eaters, or she says selective eaters, there's a very helpful uh -huh. group on Facebook called Mealtime Hostage, the group. Oh, uh -huh. She says, Mealtime Hostage. She said, sometimes it's more than being picky. There's oftentimes complex sensory integration issues. I'm, I'm sure that's true. People who yes. don't like the taste. Um, so, and yeah. It's possible that um, these kids may have a zinc deficiency, and so the way they taste things is not the way you and I would taste it. So it's oh, possible that zinc supplements might be helpful, but you don't want to give too much zinc because uh, that will unbalance the amount of copper in the body, and that's not good either. I think I've heard before from another speaker um, that zinc and iron deficiencies are very common among kids with ADHD that he tests they for are. that. And is this they something you're, you should ask your doctor to test? I um, would. If, if, if I were in a parent's shoes, I definitely would. I'd want a serum ferritin tested mm -hmm. and then um, um, a plasma zinc and red blood cell 
Um, okay. Zinc. So uh, ferritin, which is the pure essence of iron, and then uh, yeah. zinc. Yeah, he says the same thing. He said every kid that he sees, um, he has tested uh, by their doctor for zinc and, and, uh, and iron deficiencies and finds an extraordinary number of positive yes, results. Yes, yes, the studies suggest that. I'd also test for vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm. because many kids with ADHD are low in vitamin D, and this is extremely important. Vitamin D is not just to build strong bodies and teeth. It, uh, it has roles in the brain and just all kinds of things that are just being learned. So I get a vitamin D level. And I think from what I've read, many, everyone is short of vitamin D, adults and as well, right? I mean. Yes, well, we make vitamin D from sunshine, and of course, we all tend to put on um, sun protector against, you know, against getting sunburn and getting, not getting cancer then. And, mm -hmm. But the trouble is that, uh, that vitamin D isn't made then, so you're not getting the vitamin D outside, and there are very few foods that contain very much vitamin D. Right, okay. Um just want to spend a little bit of time on supplements. We have a, uh, because I think it's something that everyone's very interested in. One question, very specific question, was the 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 slides that you showed of um, the supplements, the before and after um, example. Are, is that a list? Is that a good list of supplements? I think magnesium, zinc, um, vitamin D, fatty, uh, acid. fatty acids. Right? Um, is that is that a common? Um, List is there something else you would add to that? And do you have any guidance no. on on types of magnesium specifically has been asked, or type of fatty acid? Well, the trouble with magnesium is that when you buy the magnesium, it's a fairly large tablet, but um, you can buy um, uh, magnesium in a powder form. Calm is is one of the um, supplements that my son uses. He's 45 years old, but he uses it, and uh, you get it online. So that, that's why, and you just, and my other son also takes magnesium. He's 42, and uh, he just adds it to orange juice and takes it with him to work because he feels calmer after he's had it. So hmm. calm is what they both use. I mean, I'm that's sure that there are other. Calm, C-A-L-M. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are others out there. That's a magnesium supplement. It is. Right. Okay. Fish. So many people have been advised not to eat fish more than once a week because of concerns for metal. Um, for mercury, and yes. Mercury and pollution. What's your thinking on that? Um, I think the benefits of fish outweigh the risks. Um, actually, the, the uh, fish that are raised, that are farmed, are often more um, polluted than the ones that you get out of the sea. But um, so I think I would go for um, like tuna or salmon that is um, that is gotten by by fishing. So, right. Okay. So and a couple of people. I was just going to say sorry, that's go a concern for pregnant women too. So right. I have I have a discussion of that in the book um, about what pregnant women can do to prevent uh, having a child with ADHD. So that's one of the things that should be considered. Okay. And a concern for parents, many parents here, is, is that they don't control what their kids eat at school. And they're wondering if you have any thoughts on how to get their child to buy in and take ownership of this notion of eating more healthily. That's a really, when you, you know, you really don't control everything that's in front of your child's these days. This is, this is very true. Um, the only thing I can recommend is you do kind of like a behavior modification thing where you reward them. And if they choose the right things at school, but you won't always know whether they have or not. Um, yeah, that's, that can be a difficult problem in the younger kids. If you could ask their teachers or a lunchroom supervisor to to get them to get water instead of milk if they're milk sensitive or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, and, and sometimes kids trade lunches 
persuasion right. and things like that. So that that's a problem. So you really need your child's cooperation. You know, if you tell her or him that this that this kind of a diet will help him grow up to be strong like dad and and uh, or pretty like mom and and uh, capable and strong and everything or whatever the the buzzwords might be for your family and that a good diet yeah. helps all of that and will help him play uh, say baseball or whatever the a sport is that he chooses a couple of suggestions here which are interesting um one person said her son wouldn't eat breakfast, but he would drink muscle milk on his way to school. It was high protein and low carbs. So she, that was a solution for them. Right. Um, and someone else offers the fact that Child Life has a liquid calcium with magnesium supplement that includes vitamin D and a small amount of zinc. So great. that's a nice... Oh, great. List. What was it called? Child Life. Child Life. Um, so, yeah. Um, and other people said solution to say sometimes... Um, she she could see what her children bought at school through the school website, and so she eliminated her child's ability to buy at school because he bought cookies and ice cream. So she manages what he eats that way. So yeah, sure, it's still um, it's still a challenge, no question for for it is a kids. challenge. It is yeah. definitely. Um, any any further thoughts on exercise before we close? I think if we, your examples were great about the effect of exercise helping kids. Um, do their settle down for homework. I think it's, you know, we hear so many parents who have such concerns about controlling video game time and screen time. Um, and, right. and, you know, that's kind of what's taken the place of, you know, running around outside, it would seem. Are you seeing that in your practice and how do you address that challenge? Well, I think that is a problem. And of course, if you have a neighborhood that isn't safe, you don't want to send your child out to ride his bike around, depending on his age, and mm -hmm. or, or to play outside, period. So things can be done inside, like the dancing to music. Yeah, that was a great suggestion, right? You can get one of the older children to teach the younger child, you know, how to dance and put on music that has a real beat so they can keep moving or eat. Uh, sometimes in my house, I have, I can kind of go around a circle um, from different rooms, and so, so I'll put Bruce Springsteen on and uh, walk to that. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we're out of time. This has been incredibly helpful. Laura, you're really at the cutting edge. You've been doing this for 25 years, um, and um, we thank you for all your thoughts. I'd like to also thank Omega Bright. OmegaBright.com, which is a maker of a fish oil product that it's is actually it's actually it's actually the product that I use for my chronic fatigue syndrome. Really? Okay, there you it go. Is. There's a, there's a, a speaker. Yeah. <laughs> and um, thanks again, and have a great rest of the week. Bye, everyone. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.